All right, I think that's everyone. Uh, so welcome everyone to this week's edition of Paleo Perks. Uh, this week's speaker is Marcus Adla from the University of Birmingham in the UK. And he's gonna talk to us about volcanism, weathering and the changing carbon cycle, linking carbon, strontium, lithium, osmium and uh, calcium isotope dynamics in an earth system model. Um, but before we get to Marcus's talk, we have just a few um, housekeeping things. Um, so if you're new to the seminar, uh, our general format is we'll do this quick little welcome that I'm doing now. Um, Marcus will give his talk, uh, which we will follow up with a moderated question and answer period where you can ask him uh, questions. And then Marcus has a great uh, for our virtual tea time um, after the talk as well. So please stick around if you have uh, more questions or just want to hang out with some paleo friends um, for a little while. Um, so if you have questions for Marcus during the talk, you can send those questions via the chat to the questions that Paleo Parks host, um, which this week is Jana. Uh, so Paleo Parks values the participation of everyone interested in the paleo sciences. So please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. Um, you agreed to it when you signed up to get the emails. If you found yourself here without having um, uh, agreed to the code of conduct, you can check it out on our website um, and um, sign up to get the emails and everything. Um, so yep, go ahead and check that out. It's very general, you know, just be respectful sort of stuff. Uh, please keep yourself muted for the duration of the talk. Um, I don't think you're able to unmute, but if you find that you are, please uh, remute yourself so that uh, no one's interrupting Marcus throughout his talk. Um, Again, you can ask questions by chatting to the questions at Paleo Parks host, um, or um, we've started using the raise hand function. So if you're going to do the raise hand function, wait for the official uh, question and answer period. Um, you can send questions via the chat um, at any time during the talk if you wanna make sure you don't forget. Um, if you have any technical issues, those should also go to the questions host. Um, again, via the chat. So we now have closed captions built into Zoom. Uh, you can use the CC button to show or hide them. Um, I apologize, I just realized I didn't turn them on uh, from the Google side, but you should be able to get them via the Zoom as well. Um, other quick things, uh, we're always looking for new nominations from other early career researchers. You can uh, find the nomination form on our website, it's very quick. Um, we also welcome self-nomination, so it uh, uh, you want to give a talk, uh, go ahead and nominate yourself too. Uh, and we'll drop that link into the chat along with another link that is our weekly feedback form uh, for demographic info, essentially just to see who's uh, coming to the talks. Um, it's anon anonymous and optional, but we encourage it just so we can get an idea of uh, who's attending. Um, and we'll drop that link also in the chat window. Uh, so today's speaker, as I mentioned, is Marcus Adla. Uh, so Marcus did his master's uh, and undergraduate at uh, Hamburg University in Germany before moving uh, to the UK for a PhD at the University of Bristol, which he just finished up earlier this year, um, and is currently a postdoc at the University of Birmingham. Uh, so we're very excited to hear Marcus's talk today. So if you want to go ahead and take over the screen share, Marcus. Um, Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, perfect. Okay, cool. well, thanks. Well, thank you and the whole um, Paleo Parks committee for um, inviting me for organizing this uh, talk. I'm really impressed how well it's organized and I'm really looking forward to sharing our work with you and discussing um, what, what we're doing and also maybe to hear about what you do in the question and answers. Maybe some of the things I talk about can feed into or like connect with bits that you've been working on as well. So I'd be interested to hear that too. Um, so today I would like to talk about or present to you a new tool that we developed to study the effects of or like to identify changes in volcanism and weathering, um, which uh, can be used to reconstruct carbon cycle changes in the past. And this tool essentially is um, an Earth system model impl implementation of um, a whole range of different isotope systems, in particular 
the combination of carbon isotopes with different metals, strontium, lithium, osmium, and calcium. And I'll start by explaining why these, uh, metal, these isotope systems matter or what we can do with them. Um, so when we try to reconstruct um, Earth, system Earth system states of the near past um, or look at short-term environmental changes, then we can most often trace them by um, reconstructing the redistribution of biogeochemically relevant elements in surficial reservoirs of the Earth system, in particular the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere. They are all uh, constantly in exchange, and these exchanges happen very quickly. Um, and the redistribution of elements like carbon, oxygen, and several nutrients um, between those reservoirs um, normally leaves uh, an isotopic fingerprint. So the stable isotopes of these elements um, will be fractionated um, in any transition that occurs between these reservoirs. Um, and so if tr transitions happen, we can trace that with the stable isotope systems of these biogeochemically relevant elements. However, if we are interested in Earth system states that uh, were like deeper in the past, or if we look at environmental changes that happened over much longer time scales, for example, the Cenozoic or the Mesozoic, um, then we need to change the approach because on these, on geological time scales, um, interactions between the geosphere and these um, fastly interacting um, reservoirs become important too. These exchange fluxes between the geosphere and Earth's surface are very slow and uh, on normally, um, yeah, very um, not not many not much of these elements is exchanged. But over long time scales, these effects accumulate and become important because they can change the overall abundance of um, our biogeochemically relevant elements in Earth's surface. Um, the tricky thing is, though, that these fluxes are very hard to reconstruct from the stable isotope systems of our um, elements of interest because these much faster transit processes that happen in between the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere normally uh, overprint um, any signals from the exchange flux of the geosphere. So it's quite hard to um, yeah, find weathering change signals um, in these systems. Um, you would need to kind of strip out all the other processes that could have affected these isotope systems over the same time scales. And so instead, what we can do is we can use um, other uh, elements and other isotope systems, which predominantly react to um, changes in the exchange fluxes between the geosphere and Earth's surface and are not so much impacted by uh, transit uh, transitions between these um, very quickly um, changing reservoirs. And these are, um, for example, the metals strontium, osmium, lithium, and calcium. Um, now, these metals um, have got a few advantages. Um, they are, the isotopic composition of these metals in different parts of the geosphere is quite different. So not only can we identify flux changes between the geosphere and Earth's surface with these elemental systems, but also we can try to identify which parts of the geosphere um, were um, were involved in these um, changed exchange fluxes. So for example, the uh, continental crust, um, Earth's interior, Earth's mantle, um, the ocean cr oceanic crust, or large igneous province, basalts, all have very different isotopic compositions um, and can be distinguished. Um, in, um, yeah, so that's, that's very useful. Um, the um, isotopic systems, like all of these four metals, um, behave slightly different in the Earth system. They enter the ocean in slightly different ways and are also sequestered from the ocean slightly differently. But overall, um, their isotopic dynamics can be um, kind of summarized in two uh, conceptual models that I show here. So for radiogenic isotopes uh, of strontium and osmium, um, essentially, we've got two or three main reservoirs. These are um, Earth's mantle, which has got a very isotopically light composition of these metals, um, the content of crust, which is isotopically heavy, um, and inputs from the continent through weathering processes, um, and inputs from the mantle through hydrothermal activity at the seafloor or through volcanism um, will affect the isotopic composition of these metals in the ocean. Um, that's quite straightforward. It's a little bit more complex for stable isotopes. So stable isotopes of strontium, lithium, and calcium uh, also have different isotopic compositions um, in 
the earth's mantle and uh, on the continents, um, but also fractionation occurs uh, during the deposition of these metals um, at the sea floor. And so um, we get uh, an additional isotopic effect on seawater, which results uh, in seawater being the heaviest reservoir of these stable isotopes um, today. And um, we know as well that the isotopic composition of these metals in seawater has changed throughout the past. So here is um, a compilation published by Ms. Ryan Froelich in 2012 of the isotopic composition of lithium, strontium, and osmium in seawater um, over the Cenozoic. So here, this is like the Tatius on the right hand side, here's the KT boundary, and then it goes across the Cenozoic all the way to the present day on the left hand side. Um, and we can see that over this time period, um, there were large shifts in these isotope systems, not uh, like some of them occurred on long time scales and gradually, and there are also disturbances that occurred more um, quickly. Um, and so these changes indicate that the exchange between the geosphere and Earth's surface worked differently uh, in the past. And it's very likely that not only the metal cycling was different at the same place, but also that the cycling of carbon, nutrients, oxygen between the geosphere and Earth's dynamic surface um, worked differently in, these, in the past. And so it's quite uh, important to reconstruct these because uh, a different coupling between the geosphere and Earth's surface implies a different um, sensitivity of the Earth system to external perturbation and also a different capacity to um, find a new equilibrium after a perturbation has occurred. So just to summarize, um, why are the metals, the isotope systems of strontium, osmium, lithium, and calcium useful? Well, they are useful because the processes that govern uh, the cycling of these metals also control the cycles of biogeochemically very relevant um, elements like carbon, oxygen, nutrients on long time scales. Um, the sources of these metals in the geosphere have very uh, distinct isotopic compositions and can be differentiated quite easily. Um, and also the isotopic composition of these metals in seawater um, is very homogeneous because the residence time of these metals in seawater is very long. So the ocean has enough time to mix these metals through so that um, a change in any a flux from the geosphere results, it should result in a similar isotopic shift across the globe and not just locally. And that means uh, that hopefully we only need a few records um, to study past changes in the geosphere. We don't need a very um, yeah, big coverage of the seafloor to understand how the geosphere and uh, surface earth system coupling changed over time. And then there's also discussion that uh, probably most of these isotope systems are less affected by um, biology and by biological processes. And that's very useful for um, reconstructing the isotopic composition of seawater based on the isotopic composition of sediments. So when, if there weren't many isotopic changes during the deposition, then that's, that's a useful thing for the reconstruction of seawater. And we have records of these isotope systems for a whole range of different um, interesting periods of the past, so interesting in terms of evolution, of climate change, of um, uh, tectonics. Um, we can, like, just on during the Cenozoic, for example, with the glacial and the glacial cycles, you've seen Oligocene transition, the Paleocene, you've seen thermal maximum, we've got uh, the oceanic and oxic events in the Cretaceous, as well as the Ketchup boundary. There's a whole range of these records and more and more are being produced, um, and that's really useful um, for the study of how um, yeah, volcanoes and weathering in general, the geosphere um, changed over, over these long time scales. Now, when um, it's not new that these isotope systems are being used to study um, changes in the geosphere, um, and when this is usually done, it's done with isotope mixing models. Um, and our approach, approach is now different because we incorporated the isotope dynamics of these metals into an Earth system model of intermediate complexity. Um, and I just want to quickly um, talk through some of the differences of these approaches and the advantages and disadvantages um, of, of either. So the isotope mixing model um, is a really quick and efficient way to calculate the 
mean isotopic composition of seawater based on given inputs into the ocean um, of specific isotopic composition and outputs that we know. Um, an Earth system model, essentially just the same, but instead of representing the entire ocean uh, with just one number, just one box, it uh, splits the ocean into many, many different boxes. And for each box, it calculates the isotopic composition in that box based on what metals come in and what metals leave that particular box. So you can get spatial patterns of isotopic compositions and concentrations, but you also get impacts of uh, spatially explicit processes um, on um, yeah, the metal distribution in seawater. And so in general, um, I would say the main benefits of isotope mixing models are that the calculations are really fast. They, they just take seconds. You can do them um, on paper. You don't need um, very complex um, yeah, uh, computation facilities. Um, and also these models are very easy to adapt to different conditions. So if we want to change the input fluxes, if we want to change the volume of the ocean or anything, it's very easy to adapt. An Earth system model um, takes longer to run calculations and it's a bit more complex to adapt uh, to changing boundary conditions. But the benefits are that we've got spatially resolved biogeochemistry. So we've got um, spatially resolved processes that affect the metal cycles. And we've got a whole range of different elemental cycles that all um, that are all simulated alongside each other. So they all react to the same perturbations, the same dynamics on the same um, at the same time, and are consistent internally. So the Earth system model produces an entirely consistent um, state of a whole range of different elemental cycles and um, incorporates the effects of um, spatially. Um, heterogeneous processes, whereas as dot mixing models um, are mostly look at one element at a time, but are very easy to adapt and are very fast to run. And which one of these is most uh, applicable for a given study, I think really depends on the questions that we ask. So I guess, um, well, I would say that as dot mixing models in general are very useful to study equilibria of um, metal isotope systems. Um, and also to look at um, records where we only have one of these isotope systems. Uh, if we only have information of one of them, we don't need um, to simulate all the others um, because we couldn't really do a data model comparison then. However, if we do have information of, of different um, isotope systems and we want to uh, find a scenario or an Earth system state that can reproduce our, uh, the observed records of all different uh, proxies that we have, then it can be useful to use an Earth system model instead. Um, and also, if we look at perturbations, um, it can be useful to uh, use an Earth system model. And that's because, uh, particularly in perturbations, um, spatially explicit processes become very important. Uh, so for example, sediment dissolution um, or climate changes on land that affect weathering. Like These things are usually spatially heterogeneous. Um, and so to understand how transiently um, these metal systems evolve, it can be useful to look at, uh, to use an Earth system model instead. And what we did, we used uh, the Earth system model of intermediate complexity CGNI. Um, this is an Earth system, mo system model that is particularly designed to simulate biogeochemical processes on timescales of centuries to millions of years. Um, it's got a 3D ocean. So here's an example of um, the bathymetry of the modern day setup. Um, and it's got a 2D atmosphere, and then it's got a whole range of different modules that can be turned on and off to simulate different processes that we want to account for. Um, so for example, it's got um, atmospheric chemistry, uh, biogeochemistry of the ocean, sediment dynamics, as well as climate sensitive content and weathering. It's got an energy moisture balance to simulate climate change and the effects of land surface and the ocean. It's got uh, a simple ice sheet dynamic model um, and a general ocean circulation model. And into this model that already um, traces elements like uh, carbon, oxygen, different nutrients, and their isotope systems, we now uh, added also calcium, strontium, osmium, and lithium isotopes. And these um, metals and their isotopes are brought to the ocean in the model by um, climate sensitive continental weathering fluxes, um, as well as hydrothermal inputs at the seafloor. Um, and, and some recrystallization in um, 
on the shelves. And then once the metals are in the ocean, they're being transported by the physical ocean module and eventually are deposited at the seafloor, either through incorporation into biogenic calcium carbonates uh, or into clays, in particular uh, lithium, or that we've just got some deposition um, functions that um, represent the deposition of um, metal nodules at the seafloor uh, we have as well. And these processes can all be turned on and off depending on um, how we want to represent these cycles. Um, now we took this model, we tuned it to the modern day and we managed to reproduce the isotopic and uh, um, the concentration of isotope, sorry, the distribution of isotopes and concentrations of these metals in the present day seawater. We also reproduced um, marine residence times that are very similar to those that are suggested from measurements. And so we can now go and apply this model to the past, understand how these metal systems behaved in the past. Uh, and there are two uh, cases that I would like to talk you through very quickly. The first is how we can use it to reconstruct past Earth system states. So when we look at equilibria and we just want to know how um, these metal cycles, but also the carbon cycle work different in the past at any given time. Um, and then secondly, we'll look at um, how we can study perturbations, for example, trends in climate changes, um, how these might have affected the metal cycles and the carbon cycle. So taking again our um, compilation of isotopic changes across the Cenozoic, um, we see that there were different periods in time when the isotopic composition um, of these metals were in seawater was different compared to today. This is an offset to today, yeah, and, but still, they remained quite constant uh, over different time spans. And so we can say that there were periods in time, for example, here, when we had an equilibrium in these metal systems, but um, the equilibrium was just a different one compared to today. So somehow the exchange fluxes between the geosphere and um, the, the ocean were different at the time, resulted in a different isotopic composition of these metals in seawater, um, but remained constant, like that was a stable state. And now we can try to um, reconstruct which parts of the interaction between the geosphere and the ocean were different, which processes were responsible for these offsets between uh, the present day seawater composition and uh, the past. And this has been done before um, many times using um, um, yeah, the box models, the isotope mixing models that I presented. Um, the only difficult thing is that if we look at one isotope system, for example, osmium here, um, so that's this line down here, um, I tested now a whole range of different changes that can have occurred, so like different processes that link the geosphere and the ocean, um, and I turned them down or, or increased the efficiency, and then we get effects on the osmium isotope systems, and we can identify a whole range of processes that for example, cause a negative offset um, in the isotopic composition of osmium in the past compared to today. But the difficulty is that we can't really differentiate based on this record now, um, which of these processes was responsible for the offset that we observed. And so one way of um, getting a closer understanding of which processes could explain it is to also use the information of other proxy systems that we have already extracted from the sediments and if we do that, so in CGNE now, what I did is I turned on and off these processes and tuned them up and down um, in, in a system where all these isotope systems were turned on. So they, are, they all react to the same change. Um, and we see that for each isotope system, we get isotopic responses depending on which process we turn on and off or up and down. Um, but if we look at the whole line of isotope changes, then we find that um, now if you have all these isotope systems together, there's almost no um, process change that results in the same isotopic um, signal. So we get a unique fingerprint um, of different uh, process changes if we look at all these isotope systems alongside each other. And that's one really useful way in which we can use um, the Earth system model to understand which isotopic fingerprint a specific change in the Earth system uh, would cause or could cause. Um, and as an example here, we could use the, um, we could try to reconstruct the early Eocene climate optimum 
we know that at this time, the isotopic composition of, in all these metals was different. The atomic CO2 concentration was different. We've got some estimates of the offset. Um, and now we can kind of plot all our um, isotopic changes we just got in the table from the different processes um, here in these two isotope spaces. So each plot has got um, one isotope system on the y-axis and one on the x-axis. And um, I plot, so this is, these are the model simulations. These are these uh, dots and uh, different symbols and colors. And then the isotopic composition of metals in seawater during the early Eocene is then plotted here with the uncertainty interval that we have. And so we can now look around and see which processes get us close to the Eocene offset and which ones take us maybe even the wrong way um, and do that for all different isotope systems and find which combination of processes will will take us from the present day here all the way to the early years and that's one option and the second advantage of this new earth system model uh, with incorporated metal isotope systems is that we can look at transient perturbation as well so during the Cenozoic, we did not only have um, different stable states uh, in the metal cycles but we also had like perturbations that occurred quite rapidly and were restored afterwards it didn't lead to a long-term change in the metal system that just caused a small um, peak or trough um, or a small um, transient change. And uh, we can simulate those as well with the Earth system model. Um, and here, as an example, I just simulated the um, sudden release of a lot of carbon into the Earth, uh, into the atmosphere ocean system. So here I plotted uh, the release of 5,000 petagrams of carbon in one year. Um, this is the solid line, and then there's a dotted line that's 1,000 petagrams of carbon. They're released during the first year of the simulation, and then the model is just given time to re-equilibrate afterwards. And so what happens quite quickly is that the carbon that's being released into the atmosphere is taken up into the ocean, uh, is lowering the pH, um, and is uh, kind of neutralizing uh, atmospheric CO2 that way. Um, and dissolving calcium carbonates in the deep sea further reduces uh, or further increases the ability of seawater to take up more CO2 from the atmosphere. And eventually, the climate change that occurs because of the carbon increase, temperatures here, it goes up as well, results in enhanced weathering fluxes from land that brings in alkalinity and calcium and restores the capacity of the ocean to bury calcium carbonates. And then on long time scales, if we talk like longer than 10,000 years, um, we get then enhanced calcium carbonate burial through the enhanced weathering fluxes that um, store carbon, the excess carbon again in the geosphere uh, and result or uh, like bring the earth system back to full equilibrium um, where we started from before the perturbation. And the same simulation. Um, that we have here with the transient changes in CO2 concentrations and in climate can also now trace the metal isotope systems and see what happens to these metal isotope systems at the same time as these um, as the carbon cycle res is restored uh, and climate finds its balance back um, and we can uh, when we look at these so here are the concentrations of all these different metals as they change through the same simulations and here's the CO2 concentration and climate that we've just seen. Uh, up here are the different metals. And on the right-hand side is the changes in the isotope systems. Um, and so what we see, um, that there's a lot to talk about, but that's not really important now. I was, just want to show you that um, uh, we can simulate now um, the isotopic response of all these different systems um, to one perturbation that is the same for all of them. And we see, for example, in the isotope systems that so the sudden release of a lot of carbon into the Earth's atmosphere and the resulting changes in climate and weathering will result in changes in these isotopic composition, isotopic composition of these metals in seawater. But that these uh, that the peaks or like the excursion minima or maxima do not occur at the same time uh, as the carbon 13 excursion, for example, because the processes that um, restore these different uh, cycles and the processes um, as well as the residence time of these um, elements in seawater is very different um, and so the response of each system to the same perturbation will also be different and that can be really useful um, to identify um, 
lags that we might expect in, in proxy records uh, when we measure them. Um, and to be sure that we um, trace the same perturbation in each proxy system, even though there's a time lag in when the excursion occurs. Um, and then furthermore, we can look at scenarios where we don't just have an emission of carbon and thus a weathering change, but at the same time, we can think of scenarios where um, alongside the, the carbon emission from, for example, volcanism, also metals are emitted from Earth's core into the ocean. And that means that we have two um, kind of forcings or two disturbances to the normal metal cycle. So we've got enhanced weathering from, from climate change, but we've also got enhanced delivery of metals from Earth's interior into the ocean. These have very different isotopic compositions. And so these will both um, change the isotopic composition of seawater, but in different ways. And so the question is, how will the curve or the isotopic excursion that develops in the metal systems look like when we've got overlapping forcings? And this is something we can study as well in this Earth system model now. And for example, um, in a very preliminary study that I uh, ran, we found that um, in general, if you've got weathering overlap, if you've got the delivery of um, metals from Earth's interior, alongside enhanced weathering um, fluxes, that means that the amplitude in uh, radiogenic isotope systems will be muted. So we get a smaller response to uh, the input of mental, um, uh, we get, a, in general, we get a smaller response than we would expect from each individual process. Uh, and also the peak in the isotope record or the um, maximum or minimum excursion occurs earlier in time than if we only had one forcing. Um, however, in the stable isotope system, we get an enhanced response in the isotopic offset in seawater. And that's because in the stable isotope systems, both affects weathering changes and um, enhanced delivery of metals from the mantle will um, pull the system in the same direction. And it's the restoration of the, uh, the metal cycles over long time scales that will then um, restore the, the very heavy isotopic composition of seawater after any perturbation. So just to sum up, um, we've now got an Earth system model that we can use to simulate climate change, carbon cycle dynamics, alongside the dynamics of strontium, lithium, osmium, and calcium, um, and their isotopes. We can use that to test hypothesis of how these metals behave in the present day ocean or might have behaved in the past. We can use it to reconstruct the coupling between the geosphere and the ocean um, at in different Earth system states, uh, and we can use it to understand how metal isotope excursions might form under different um, forcings. Um, and if you would like to know more, um, there's a lot of information about that in my PhD thesis, but also um, we just published um, uh, the um, yeah the model and its description in. Um, GMD in geoscientific model development. So you're very, very welcome to look at that as well. And of course, please, if you're interested in this and would like to chat about it or maybe uh, use the model or think about using it, then get in touch. Uh, I would be very happy to talk to you. Um, and my email address is here if you are interested. And I think now, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your questions and to a discussion with you. Um, Please let me know if anything was unclear or if I, you would like me to explain anything again. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Hey, uh, thanks. So that was really interesting. Um, we have a few questions coming in already. So I'll get started. Yeah. Uh, but also just a reminder, you can send uh, questions uh, via the chat to uh, Jenna, who's the questions at Paleo Parks host, um, or raise your hand and I can unmute you um, and you can ask your question um, out loud. Um, so our first question um, is, can this work be done using any other Earth system models or is CGenie most suitable? Um. Yes, yeah, so in theory, so, so we implemented these isotope dynamics into CGE 
we can't just take them and put them into another model now. We would have to start again with another model, but that's in theory possible. Um, the only thing is that, uh, the only question is which processes are represented by the model. So these metal cycles, they, they kind of need a weathering input and a seafloor input. Um, so it would be useful to have processes that represent those or kind of some kind of approximations that one can use. Um, and also to look at the timescales involved. Some of these metals react on very long timescales. Osmium is very quick comparatively, like it reacts within a few tens of thousands of years. The other metals take up to millions of years. So if the model gets too complex, it might be very expensive to run it for these long timescales. But in theory, yeah, that they could be added to any model, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Um, that kind of leads in actually to the next question, uh, which says, can you use this approach further back in time, uh, for example, in the Paleozoic? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So in, in theory, yeah, you can use it across like any, like in any time period that did have like a liquid ocean and a solid uh, surface. But um, the only tricky thing is to know the boundary conditions. So in order to set up the simulations and, and do experiments, you need to make assumptions on how much metal was in the ocean at the time um, and how big were the fluxes before any perturbations or um, yeah, between uh, surface and the ocean and, and then the seafloor and the ocean. And that can be quite tricky the further back we go in time because um, there's very little information uh, available. I mean, that just makes it more interesting probably as well. And this, um, this model is quick enough to run that can be used to test a whole range of different assumptions. So even if we don't know an exact number, we could just assume a, a range uh, and test how um, this Earth system would look like under these assumptions. That's possible, uh, but it requires a bit more kind of yeah, preparation work and, and thinking into what the boundary conditions might be. Um, but yeah, so, so even further back, there was one, we've got one collaborator who would like to use it to study uh, the big oxygenation events um, that have occurred. Um, in the, yeah, so that's, that's very long time ago. <laughs> uh, all right, um, so we have uh, another question. Um, it says, very interesting talk. I was wondering if there is a spatial threshold for the model. Did the stable isotopes and radiogenic, ah, sorry, I lost it, oh, and radiogenic fingerprints work best in shallow ocean settings, uh, e.g. shelf lagoons uh, or deep oceans? And I'll put that into the chat since I uh, yeah. sort of um, missed it in the middle. Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. So we focus on the open ocean dynamics but there are some really important processes that occur in uh, the shallow oceans and along the coastlines, um, which at the moment we have to parameterize or just make assumptions, like we adapt essentially the fluxes that come in from land for the processes that, for example, trap metals directly in the coast or in delta systems. Um, so that's a, a very good point. Um, I think if, if one wants to focus on more shallow sections of the ocean, then it would be it, it would be useful to make a, a few further changes and add a few more processes so that we can explicitly resolve them and, and simulate them. For the moment, it's really set up for the open ocean. Um, yeah, and, and as far as we know, um, really what matters to these metal systems, like for, for the stable isotope systems, it matters what happens in the ocean because there's fractionation that occurs, for example, when strontium and calcium are, calcium are being incorporated into biogenic carbonates or orthogenic carbonates. Um, but especially for osmium and lithium, um, we think the main processes that affect these isotope systems are the different input fluxes and for lithium, the amount of clay burial. Um, it's not so important. Um, like, yeah, the water column is less important for these metals as far as we know, but, but there are open questions. Um, and yeah, that's something we can look at as well. All right. Um, I think you sort of started answering uh, this question maybe as it was coming in, but I'll go ahead and put it in anyway. Um, so what is the time scale for this model? For example, can you run this for the whole 
Yeah, so that's what about a resolution question. requirement since different isotope systems have different? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, that's another very good question. Um, so in theory, it can be run for very long time scales. Um, one, there are only two things to consider. One is that we don't have a dynamic, um, we don't have dynamic tectonics. So if you run it for too long, we, we just essentially keep the same tectonic boundary conditions throughout the simulation. And if you run it for too long, at some point it just gets um, unrealistic because uh, tectonics, tectonic processes happen on timescales of multi-million years. Um, and the question is how realistic is a simulation that goes for like on for millions of years if we don't have dynamic tectonics. But um, the other thing is the computational costs, of course. So here in these uh, simulations, I did actually run them for 15 million years, these simulations, just because it, that, that's just um, a made up perturbation that is not meant to represent anything that has actually occurred. I just wanted to see how long the model takes to find like its previous balance again, its previous uh, stable state. Um, and so it takes, depending on the metal cycle we look at, it can take like several millions of years to fully equilibrate again. Um, and this took about um, two months to run the simulation. So that's another constraint is like the time we have to run the simulations. For shorter ones, uh, they, yeah. In theory, we could run like the whole Cenozoic. It would take probably half a year to run and it wouldn't have any tectonic shifts or we would have to find a, like a solution of stopping the simulation, adjust the boundary conditions, start it again or something. There might be ways of doing that, uh, but an easy start and let it run for the whole Cenozoic I think is, is a bit unrealistic with this model. But if we, yeah, if, if you have a module that can simulate dynamic tectonics, then that could be done, that can be coupled. Yeah. All right, so one just uh, showed up in the chat to everyone uh, that says, thanks Marcus, very interesting talk. I wonder whether the lithium and strontium and osmium proxy data sites are sufficient to apply data assimilation techniques at some point. Yeah, so that's um, that's that's another good point, and that's that's something that we've been looking into. Um, it would be great to do that. Um, what we str struggled with is a little bit the um, the availability of records. Like some of these metals are really hard to measure, um, particularly osmium um, and strontium are very heavy metals, and uh, as far as I'm aware, like it's quite hard for that to. Um, to measure them and to measure other elements that are much lighter again and like you have to readjust all the systems also the concentrations of these metals are very low um, in in a lot of natural samples so it can mean we need a lot of a sample can be quite expensive um, but but we started so we did a kind of assimilation of present day seawater data that we have like uh, concentrations like metal concentrations and isotopic compositions uh, to see if, if the model can reproduce the distributions that we see. Um, and and we, it, it was good for, for calcium and strontium, that was great, that worked very well. For lithium, it was okay as well, but for osmium, the problem was, like osmium and lithium, there are very few um, water column uh, data sets. Uh, we mostly, because the concentrations, particularly for osmium are so low, um, we mostly have data sets of sediment composition but we can't use that to assimilate the water column uh, values. So uh, there, there have been some difficulties there and there were also some inconsistencies in the osmium records. Like there, there were some um, there's discussion about the um, uncertainties that were involved, particularly in the early studies. So there's some data that um, we are still missing to do a full assimilation, but for the past, that's something we hope we can do. So if we've got um, a good, idea of what the mean isotopic composition of seawater was back in time, then we hope that we can use that yeah, to simulate and kind of use the metal isotope systems to constrain the, the tectonic forcing and the uh, yeah, carbon fluxes from the geosphere at a given time. Yeah. I, I see uh, one more um, that asks, have you considered the sulfur cycle? <laughs> yeah, 
It's a very good point. Yeah, um, it's a very good point. Sulfur is simulated by Sujini as well. I didn't turn it on in these simulations, They're very easy ones, but it will, it, will, it does matter. Um, it's, it's a very interesting one because sulfur, the sulfur cycle will react uh, to some of the forcings that affect particularly the osmium and lithium cycles. So formation of evaporites, for example, which strips the ocean of lithium, but also of sulfur. Um, and uh, osmium um, gets incorporated a lot into organic rich sediments, uh, and uh, they're also often rich in sulfur. So, so it would be very interesting to do experiments to test um, how, or like to add sulfur and its isotopes to the range of proxies that we look at when we try to reconstruct the nervous system state. Definitely, I agree with that, yeah. All right, I don't think I see any other questions. All right, and you've been answering lots of questions, so that's probably okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and grab back the screen share. Okay. Hold on. Sorry, my computer's doing something odd. Okay, is this showing up? Yeah. Okay. All right, so thank you everyone uh, for coming to the talk and especially thank you Marcus for um, giving such an interesting talk. Um, so we'll drop the survey link uh, back into the chat again um, in case you still want to uh, fill that out. And uh, please join us next week uh, at the same time to hear uh, Dr. Ryan Mohammed, uh, uh, who has not sent a title yet, but uh, does generally sort of conservation paleo uh, sort of work. So it could be very interesting. Um, and so with that, uh, Marcus has agreed to stick around um, for a little bit for tea time. Um, so we can uh, talk more um, with Marcus and with other uh, people who stick around for tea time um, about the talk or any paleo uh, related things that come up. Um, so please do stick around for that um, before you get back to um, your classes or whatever else you have going on today. Um, so before we get to that, we'll have a quick break before um, we start the tea time. So you can uh, stretch your legs grab some water, all of that. Um, and we'll be back in two minutes with Marcus. So um, thanks again, and we'll see you in a bit. <laughs>